Hello, everybody. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome you to Lunchbox Science. Um, now, before we begin, I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water, and culture. I am currently uh, on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. And I further acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which you are and pay respect to their elders, past, present, and future. Now, we're going to have uh, Professor Mark Dads here. And if you have any questions, then those can be submitted via the Q&A tab. If you take a look at your screen, um, at the very bottom, there should be a Q&A tab where you can submit your questions. But let's get started by introducing Professor Mark Dads. Hello. So Hello. it is my absolute privilege to introduce uh, Professor Mark Dads. He is a professor of psychology at the University of Sydney and the director of the Child Behavior Research Clinic, uh, which develops state-of-the-art treatment for children and adolescents with behavioral and emotional problems. His expertise and interests focus on child and family mental health, parenting and family processes, prevention and early intervention for antisocial behavior and mental health disorders. So he also practices as a clinical, clinical child psychologist and his treatment methods were the subject of the 2014 ABC TV documentary, Kids on Speed, for which he was awarded the inaugural Australian Psychological Society Award for media engagement with science. So I would like to hand over to Mark for what can a child's eye gaze tell us all about pathways to mental health versus dysfunction. All right, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. I'll be, uh, I'll be talking for about half an hour and then we can uh, chat about any questions anyone has. So this is a very specific and interesting, uh, oh, look at that. Okay, so I'm gonna start by talking about the idea of super stimuli. This is a really fascinating idea. And to tell you about this, I'm gonna talk about the Australian beetle, the Backwelly beetle from Northern Western Australia. Now the Backwelly beetle is very interesting and is uh, on the verge of extinction or is at risk for extinction. Why? Because the Backwelly beetle loves to mate with Australian beer bottles. So unfortunately, instead of uh, mating with the female of the Backwelly species, the male Backwelly is often seen on the side of the road humping beer bottles. Now, why is this the case? It's very interesting that the beer bottle actually provides a stimulus that turns on a very primitive part of the beetle brain involved in copulation. So whenever it sees a glistening beer bottle on the side of the road, it actually can't help itself, but it is um, driven to start mating with the beer bottle. And so the beer bottle to the Backwelly beetle is a form of super stimulus. In other words, it provokes a very primitive and very strong response. Now, I'm going to talk about that with reference to what we do. I direct the Child Behaviour Research Clinic at the University of Sydney, where we treat kids with early onset conduct problems. In other words, they're aggressive, antisocial, don't do as they're told, and so on. Now, these kids are not all the same. The most common sort of child with, common, with conduct problems is what we might call the, you can see at the top, hot conduct problems. They are emotional they're uh, anxious and their, their aggression is very hostile, reactive to their environment. They're very susceptible to the environments they're in. But there's a, um, another group of children with conduct problems that we might call cold conduct problems or callous and emotional or CU traits. And these kids tend to be aggressive and antisocial in a kind of uh, deliberate cold way. They're less susceptible to environments they show low levels of guilt, lack of emotion, they don't care and so on. Now these kids are very interesting to us because they are more difficult to treat in a traditional manner. Now this figure that you can see now shows pre, post and follow up with our traditional treatment, which is a positive parenting program. And you can see that the black and the uh, green 
graphs, the children do very well. The level of their conduct problems drops all the way down at post-treatment and at follow-up, they're still doing quite well. But the children in the blue graph there, you can see they don't respond as well to positive parenting. And so these kids with conduct problems and callous and emotional traits have become a, a, a big interest around the world for how can we you know, shift them to a more pro-social, empathic, developmental path. So what can we do about these kids? Well, humans have a very precise uh, super stimuli which occurs from birth onwards. And this is the face, emotion, especially emotional faces of other human beings. So you may want to join me there with trying to identify those emotions. The little girl on the left is showing fear or surprise. The one in the middle is anger. And obviously the fellow down the bottom is showing sadness. Now these emotional faces are super stimuli. They will turn on particular very primitive parts of the human brain early uh, in development, perhaps even from birth instantly. Now you can see here in this figure, this is just showing the size of the relationship between a child's ability to recognize emotional faces um, and their traits. Now the, the light gray graph on the very right, this one, oh yeah, I might, this one here, is showing that hot-blooded combat problem children are very poor at recognizing neutral faces. In other words, uh, they, they can't say what they are. And the reason for that is that they interpret neutral faces as being very hostile, which is interesting. But the one I want you to notice here is this one. Now, children with these callous traits are very poor at recognizing fear faces. Now, why is that interesting? Well, fear is a very interesting emotion. It's been the subject of a lot of work, and it's interesting that fear is generally expressed here in the eye region of human faces. The whites of the eyes, the whites of our eyes, and bulging open eyes are a super stimulus that turn on alarm, alarm systems in the human brain. And another aspect of this is this. Have a look at this fellow here. This fellow is showing a very aggressive, angry face. If we came across that, our best way of surviving and passing on our genes would be to run away from this fellow and survive. But if we look at this face here, this is a fear face. Now I ask you to consider, if you saw this face and you want to survive, which way should you run? Well, it's not necessarily away from her, it's actually away from what she's looking at. So her fear face is signaling that there's a threat in the environment in this case, this spider here. And so if we want to survive this situation, the best thing we can do is look, notice her fear, her fear stimuli, these whites of the eyes, work out where she's looking and then run away from that. Now this is what we call in psychology theory of mind, the idea to follow the gaze of another human. And it's a very advanced skill. For example, uh, my cat, who I thought was very intelligent, was never able to do that. So if I you know, looked at her and said, your food is here, she could never follow my eye gaze. Some dogs can do that, elephants can do it, but humans certainly can do it. So fear is a very interesting emotion. It's expressed in the eyes, and it tells us a lot about the experience of other people. Now, this is how we typically process a fear face. We look at the eye region like that. This is very classic how a healthy human being processes human faces. This is a participant from, who has a, an impairment in the amygdala or the fear signaling part of her brain. And you can see that she doesn't process the face in the same way. 
she tends to avoid the eyes or, or uh, miss the eyes. But interestingly, if you look at this graph over here on the right, this is how good this woman is at recognizing fear faces. She's much lower than healthy people. But if you ask her to look at the eyes, then she can recognize the fear face. So the problem here with this person with this impairment in this part of the brain is that they don't look at the eye region of human faces. Now we thought, is it possible that our children with callous conduct problems have got the same uh, impairment? And this is a eye tracking study we did in Sydney. And you can see here that these are healthy boys. And when they look at the human face, again, they tend to focus on the eye region. But if you look at children with these cold conduct problems, you can see that their face processing tends to be a lot more random. And when we uh, ask them to look at the eyes, so this is their ability to recognize a fear face, it's much lower than healthy children. When we direct their attention towards the eye region, we can see that we rescue their ability to recognize uh, emotions and they look, start to look like healthy children. So we have very strong evidence that these kids are not paying attention to the eye region of human faces. Now these studies, however, were done with computers. So uh, a few years back when I was in London, we actually looked at the kids uh, interacting with their mothers. So we put them in a room and they did lots of lovely free play and so on. And we observed how often the children were looking at their mothers. You can see that uh, the healthy kids, that's these ones, have got good levels of eye contact, good levels of physical affection and verbal affection towards their mums. The kids with conduct problems, the hot variety, the emotional variety, have got good eye contact as well. They're down on affection, but they've got good eye contact. It's the children with these callous cold traits, again, that are showing this interesting deficit in eye gaze. So I'll show you what eye gaze looks like in a quite a healthy diet. This is from our London study and the sun came out, so it's very blary on this day, but have a look at this. Now you can see there that it's a, it's a lovely affectionate uh, relationship between these two and they have no discomfort with sharing eye gaze. Very, very interesting. And you may reflect on that in your own life. Do you actually make eye gaze with other people in your family and so on? Your loved ones, your children? It's very interesting that most people will say that they made eye contact when they were romantically in love. They make eye contact like that with newborn babies and they make eye contact like that with their pets, dogs. Very interesting. Now, my interpretation of this is that this eye gaze is a fundamental uh, dance that we perform with each other. It happens at the first moments in life and that it is associated with learning to understand and read other people's and care about what other people feel. And if you are lacking this, uh, this kind of fundamental drive to look into the eyes of others, then that's gonna be associated with low levels of development of empathy, low susceptibility to parenting environments and so on. So we think that there's a possibility with these children that they are lacking this kind of reciprocated eye gaze early in life. Now you may be thinking at this point, oh, come on, that also happens in uh, other children, autism. And you'd be exactly right for thinking that. This is an eye gaze plot of a child looking at a face with autism. And you can see they're focusing on the mouth here. This is a typically developing child focusing on the eye region. And this is a child with developmental delay, but not with autism. And you can see the eye gaze there is, is quite regular again. So we've got this 
this lack of eye gaze early in life appears to be what we might call a transdiagnostic factor. In other words, it's applying across these kids with conduct problems and autism early in their lives. Now, we know a little bit about the uh, psychophysiology of this, and a lot of this uh, early kind of propensity to focus on the eye region of other people is driven by this very old hormone called oxytocin. Now, you may know this because it's used as a uh, way of um, inducing uh, childbirth. We use it very commonly now in, in Western societies and so on. But we also know that oxytocin is one of the fundamental uh, biological processes involved in attachment. It, as in the words of Tom Inzel, the levels of oxytocin and so on uh, drive who is important to you, who you die for, who you're pair bonded with, who will take care of you. And we know that oxytocin is associated with the drive of a parent to engage in this sort of reciprocal eye gaze with a child. It drives the, the gaze, it drives touch, and it also dry, drives the sort of sing-song type vocalization that we use when we first interact with babies. We also know, I couldn't resist showing you the slide, it's very interesting. We also know, as I said before, that humans feel very comfortable making reciprocated eye gaze with dogs. And the dogs have developed a human type oxytocin system that allows them to share eye gaze and warmth and, and attachment with us. It's very interesting. And in this wonderful study, this Japanese group showed that we uh, get an oxytocin hit when we look at a dog in the eye. If you give a dog a shot of oxytocin, they'll actually look into our eyes even deeper and we'll get a blast of oxytocin from them. But interestingly, it does not occur in wolves, as you can imagine. They have not developed this reciprocal oxytocin system. So my recommendation to you is be careful. Don't try and make eye gaze with a wolf if you ever come across one. Now, oxytocin helps us to recognize emotion in other people's eyes. So if you look at this fellow here, what would you guess that this person is feeling? Jealous? panicked, whoops, sorry, hateful, arrogant. Well, the correct answer in this test is panicked. And especially in that eye there, you can see there's a very panicky type uh, sensation. Now, oxytocin levels predict how well we do that. And with uh, my colleague, Alan Guastella, we showed that even if you just give people a whiff through their nose of oxytocin, they become more focused on the eye region here and they become better at reading other people's emotional faces. Now we showed that the, in the genetics of oxytocin is impaired in these children with high callous combat problem children. So they have, where's my, here it is here. They have lower levels of plasma oxytocin and they have higher levels of methylation of the oxytocin gene, which means that it's being shut down. So what have we learned so far? Children with kind of cold, callous, unemotional traits tend to not pay attention to the eye region of human faces. Therefore, they're not good at reading other people's emotions. And so they're very insensitive to the feelings of other people. And a lot of this seems to be in part associated with an impairment in the oxytocin system, which is the fundamental way that drives us to pay attention to other people and attach to them. So my last little point for today is, can we change this early? Now you may remember in Kath and Kim, she was always saying, look at me, look at me, look at me, before she would engage with her daughter. Is it possible that we can change this natural propensity to look at eye gaze in children? 
Now, one way we might do that is by giving them a hit of oxytocin. Uh, that's being done with autism, and there seems to be some data to indicate it may help improve that, but it hasn't been done with our conduct problem kids yet. So we've been trying to change it uh, through psychological methods. And to cut a long story short, when we're training the parents how to manage these kids with aggression and so on, we've been experimenting with the ability of the parents to look the child in the eye, to get the child to look back, and to feel very comfortable with uh, reciprocated eye gaze in these kids in the hope that it will shift them uh, you know, into more empathic pro-social pathways. Now this figure shows our latest study on this and the blue graph shows children that we've uh, exposed to their, well trained their parents in making reciprocal eye gaze. Now you can see that their eye gaze is very low down here, but when we train their parents, their eye gaze comes right up nice and high, it's beautiful. But look what happens when we go follow them up at post and follow up treatment, they're back to their pre-treatment levels. And it's the same for their rejecting of their mother's eye gaze. When we train the parents in how to do this, their rejection levels come right down. So we're seeing a lovely increase in the kid's eye gaze. But when we follow them up, they're back to the way they started. But despite this, we're still getting these wonderful kind of improvements in their levels of conduct problems. They're coming right down and they're showing a massive improvement to we got compared to what we got in that earlier study. But the bad news is their levels of callous and emotional traits are just improving a little bit, but we would like to be bringing it right down here. So we can improve these kids' conduct problems through pairing interventions, but the, the dream I have of being able to improve their levels of callousness and improve their engagement and their eye contact and their empathy, so far haven't been able to produce any kind of permanent change in these kids at this point. So I'm gonna shut up and we can have a, a little bit of a discussion about this. But let me summarize what I've uh, presented to you today. The eyes and the emotional expressions of other people are super stimuli in human beings. They grab our attention early in life and they scaffold all sorts of learning in us about what it is to be human, what it is to care about other people. Attention to the face and the eye region of other humans is a critical part of development of emotion recognition, social cognition, and the development of higher human forms like empathy. Deficits in the uh, propensity to look at the eyes of other people are associated with problems in the development of these skills. I can get brief change in it by asking children to look at the eye region of others and by training their parents, but at the moment, getting fundamental change into this eye gaze type uh, situation appears to be particularly uh, challenging. I think this is a critical part of human development. It goes to the fundamental nature of our humanity. And, uh, over the next few years, we're gonna be working with more and more ways of trying to improve these children's lives earlier, early in their life. Thank you very much to my team and all of the people who helped me with this research. And I am now open to questions and discussion. Thank you, Stephen. All right, thank you very much. So we have a couple of questions that have come in already. And a reminder, if you want to submit your own questions and at the bottom of the screen, there's a little Q&A button. Um, so you can click there and submit your questions there and uh, we'll get to them. So first, uh, I guess the first question that's come up is, um, have you studied whether this differs between different cultures? Um, different cultures have different um, customs behind how much eye contact is appropriate. Have you seen a difference there? Uh, thank you very much. That's a really, really great question. And it's one that we know a little bit about, a fair bit about, I should say. 
and that is that there are differences in cultures in the appropriateness of certain sorts of eye gaze, eye reciprocated eye contact, but it's different from what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is a very primitive, low level response to the eye region of others. And that one is quite stable across cultures. So if I do this, if you watch my face, if I do this, and make eyes like that, your brain is instantly notices those kind of eye region things. That is very different from a cultural thing about is it appropriate for me to hold eye gaze with a, an adult or a child or something like that. So the cultural differences are at another higher, more deliberate level, but the fundamental brain uh, processes in that eye gaze are probably quite consistent across human cultures. All right, excellent. So perhaps the next question. So to, to what extent do you have evidence for um, these problems occurring in childhood continuing into adulthood? To what extent might they resolve themselves and to what extent are they correlated with, with behavioral problems as an adult? Yeah, yeah, fantastic question. And we're at the moment, we're at Liverpool Hospital, we're engaged in a three year longitudinal study mapping the process from birth to three years, um, which will tell us a lot about its early trajectory. In terms of the longer trajectory of it, there's very few studies have been done of this. In autism, there was a study done a few years ago by a group at Yale, which showed a fascinating finding that children with autism seem to know, show the normal improvement in, in eye gaze from birth. They, their eye, eye gaze seems to be healthy at birth. It's going up as we would expect. And then about the first year of life, it seems to suddenly fall. And we have some evidence that in autism, that once the eye gaze has decreased like that, it can be a trait all the way through life. Um, I, with callous kids, we know that they have a lower face preference around uh, six months of age, but the longest we've shown uh, in a longitudinal study is actually quite slim at this point. So the guess is that it is a chronic uh, propensity, but we don't know at this point. Right, excellent. Um, so perhaps another question. Um, so in your uh, in the studies that you cited, then um, uh, some results were gained by giving the patients a, a shot of uh, oxytocin. Is there a way? Is there a less invasive or more handily available way of um, in increasing oxytocin production in people without direct intervention? Yes, that's, uh, that's a, a really great blue sky question because that's where a lot of the science of this is going to go. So when a person has a healthy oxytocin system and attachment and so on, just cuddling them, being close to them, uh, all sorts of attachment type stimuli will increase uh, the levels of oxytocin naturally. In children that have been neglected and abused, giving them cuddles like that leads to a blunted effect. So it may be that their system is not so responsive. Um, over the last decade, the uh, whiffing oxytocin, you know, giving people a nasal spray has been uh, the thing that's been driving a lot of the research. And there is some evidence that this does improve eye gaze and so on. And, but the, how much of that is getting into the brain and how much is getting into the parts of the brain that we want it to be into is quite controversial at this point. It's getting in there, but it's probably not getting into the right places in the doses we want. So there are a number of groups now all over the world that are trying very hard to improve oxytocin delivery systems uh, so that we can actually start to have it as a powerful potential medication for treating social cognition problems like this. All 
right. So the next question. Um, so do you have any data on the, the children with these cold behaviors, um, where that might come from? Like, is it, um, is it associated with genetic, to what extent do you think it's associated with genetic problems or associated with uh, traumatic experiences early in life? Do you have any uh, data on that? Uh, yes, we do. Um, so all complex human traits are clearly a combination of genetics and environment. They, they play each other. Um, and, you know, the old world of going, it's genetic or it's nurturance is, is no longer really, um, you know, it doesn't cut the mustard anymore. Now, with, with hot-blooded conduct problems, we, we have a very good model of how they tend to occur. And that is that these kids tend to be impulsive and so on, and they, they get involved in these battles with their parents, which become self-fulfilling. And so they get locked into this coercive, aggressive cycles. And these kids, so it's, it's being maintained a lot by the environment. And so for them, the treatment of choice is these really positive parenting programs. With children with the cold callous traits, there is um, evidence that it may be a little bit more, have a more of a genetic driver. And we, there is some evidence from the UK as well as our lab that the oxytocin receptor gene may be being dampened in these kids. And the UK evidence indicates that that may be present at birth. And so that these kids are coming into the world with less propensity to actually, you know, in, attach and, and show these kind of uh, empathic uh, relationships with other people. Interestingly, the UK study also showed that the kids who had the oxytocin gene dampened at birth, it was also associated with their parents being exposed to more trauma and substance abuse and all that early in their life. So there is a possibility that the kids are being influenced by the history of the parents before they're born and that the kids are coming into the world with their epigenetics being varied to prepare them for a tough life because that's what their parents have been exposed to. That, that's extremely interesting. Um, so another question, which is, uh, I guess, slightly related. So there are many, re so aside from genetic problems, there are many reasons why people or children might have trouble making eye contact, whether they have visual impairments or, or perhaps they're in the COVID world where they're Zooming with everybody and have difficulty actually seeing them. Do you know, like, do these situations where there are other reasons uh, for having difficulty making eye contact also show up in your data? Have you studied these? Yes. Now, I'm, I'm so glad you asked that. Thank you for that question, because I've been using the visual uh, system, you know, as my example here, eye gaze and so on. But the part of the neural system that it's driving here is the threat and the attachment systems. And these things will be functional, even if the person isn't using visual input into them. So if someone is born blind or something, they're still going to be uh, susceptible to threat. They're still going to be driven to attach and so on, but other sensory input will feed into that. So um, the example I'm using is eye gaze because humans are very, very uh, prepared to use their visual system. You know, we, we, we really do take a lot of information from the environment through the visual system but we do take information through other systems as well. And if the visual system isn't working, we're going to be relying on that other information. So this stuff can apply to other um, sensory input as well. So for example, there's been some evidence that these callous kids don't recognize the sounds of, of, a, of a blood curdling scream as well. As, um, so the distress kind of, um, uh, impairment appears to be widespread, but mostly easily seen early in life through that kind of super stimuli of the eyes of other people. Uh -huh. So it's, it's not just visual, it's something else that uh, involves many of our senses. Um, so is there, so what ways do you have of identifying, uh, 
what way, at what age can you start to identify children with these, uh, with these sorts of issues? Is there a way of trying to detect them early so that you can get therapy in earlier? Is that effective? Absolutely. So the way we assess it is actually quite simple. And that is that we just ask their parents, um, does your child care about other people? Does your child feel guilt when they do something wrong? Does your child show, show emotions and so on? And parents are pretty good at reporting on this. Um, so we just, we can uh, assess these traits, excuse me, the, in the scientific literature, the earliest reliable validation through these parent reports and so on has been with two and a half year old kids. So yes, we can identify it quite early. And then with teachers, you can do it when the kids start to go into uh, preschool and, and so on. You just ask the teachers the same question. Does this child care? Do they, uh, do they notice other people's emotions? Do they feel guilt? Do they have empathy and so on and so forth? Uh, so maybe uh, next a practical question for, um, uh, for parents of such children or, uh, or psychologists working in schools who might encounter children with, that they suspect have these sorts of issues, how would you recommend that they deal with or try and, uh, or try and engage with the children? Yes, so um, the treatment of choice for children with uh, aggression, conduct problems, non-compliance, these sorts of antisocial type characteristics is still um, working with their caregivers to, to, to help them manage the child's behaviour. So the best evidence for these kids is still positive parent training type programs, uh, which Australia leads the world on, and they are available um, you know, throughout the country, especially in Sydney. We, there's lots of really excellent programs, including our clinic in Camperdown. Um, so the treatment for kids with behaviour problems is still the parent-delivered positive parent training program or if you're dealing with them in the school, a behavioural management program to improve their behaviour. In terms of the extra callous traits, then the recommendations are to try and find ways to engage with these kids, whether it be with eye gaze or um, attachment, lots of positive engagement and love and rewards and so on. Um, and so on. The evidence of whether this adds value at this point is pretty slim at this point. So that's why my best recommendation is to go back to the, the positive parent training programs. Because in the figure I showed you, even though the kids with callous traits did worse than other children, they still showed an improvement. So I like to say, you know, positive parenting is the clean water of child mental health. And that's still the best way we have of helping these kids. All right. Um, so actually, maybe another question. So uh, along along those lines. So there are, as as before, there are children who can have um, abnormal abnormal eye gaze problems for various other reasons, without showing any negative behavior traits. Um, how how prevalent is this? How prevalent is what? Um, so uh, children who might have abnormal eye gaze problems for other reasons that aren't associated with callous. Um, uh, with hot or cold callous, uh, callousness issues. Um, do you see a lot of children who don't have um, eye gaze and other and problems like this, but nonetheless uh, are well-developed emotionally? Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, question because, you know, to answer that question, we would need an epidemiological study. Uh, you know what I mean? We would need a study where we're sampling large populations and, and getting some kind of benchmarks now that has not been done. Eye gaze has been studied in small samples of healthy people as control groups in autism, um, in the callous kids we're working with, but these are small clinical samples. There has never been a, um, an epidemiological benchmarking study. So we really don't know what the population levels of this are. And I think the, the last question that we have here. Um, so in children with, uh, with these issues, do you notice a difference between how they interact with different people? So for example, do they learn the reactions of people they interact with frequently and ha but have much more trouble with, problem, 
with people out in the general public who they don't interact with, or is it uniform across all of the people who they interact with? Um, yeah, really good question. Well, I, again, we, we, we don't know because we haven't studied them with everybody, but I can tell you this, when we just show them the faces they don't know, you know, neutral faces on the computer, we see the deficit. When we watch them interacting with their um, parents, we've been able to see the same deficit. So my guess would be that it's fairly uh, generalized across the board. All right, well, Thank you very much for, uh, for telling us about this. This is extremely interesting and uh, quite applicable for many, I'm sure. Um, uh, so I would like to let everybody know that a recording of this talk will be uploaded to sydney.edu.au slash science in the next few days. So if you missed part of this or you want to show it to, uh, to somebody else, then you can go there and view this. Uh, don't miss our next Lunchbox Science with uh, Dr. Rachel Gray, which will be happening on Wednesday, the 15th of July in two weeks at 12 noon. Uh, and she'll be presenting Saving the Australian Sea Lion. Registrations are now open at sydney.edu.au slash science. Once again, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dads. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, this has been fun and enlightening. And we hope to see you again.